All right, I'm gonna continue the OS dev here again today. I got a couple new things here, but what I have planned, what I have planned is some refactoring stuff here, hopefully some lighter fare for about an hour, we'll find out. I don't wanna to go too heavy into headache, brain aches tonight, so we'll see. I'm planning on changing the system calls to return an integer value instead of just a void so that we can make things a little more succinct to get rid of a little more inline assembly in favor of just plain C code. And since the Microsoft and System 5 ABIs specify that integer or pointer return types should be returned within the AX register, so EAX in my case for 32-bit, uh, it should make some of the returns a little bit easier and a little bit better, slightly more idiomatic. It'll just, it'll look nicer. I wanted to update for that, and I also wanted to have a sort of a register struct we can pass around since we're pushing everything on the stack for the system called dispatcher. I, I think that we can just use a struct with those registers specified. Well, we can say we can pass them to the system calls themselves. We won't be passing it explicitly, but it'll sort of be passed implicitly since we're pushing everything on the stack before the system call is, is called. So I figure a register struct, kind of like how Linux does it, you know, all the register values in there. They're, they'll all be four bytes each. I won't pass a pointer. I think we can just say the struct is a, a chunk of memory. So we can say this amount of memory is expected to be on the stack and that'll be the input to the function. In 32-bit with the C calling convention, that's okay. Everything's passed on the stack anyway for, for C decal, C declare. For 64-bit, this would be different since that specifies registers, not just the stack. So uh, that might have to change way later on when we do that, but that's all right. Uh, malloc would be a little bit differently since I, I was testing this the other night and that's why this is recorded today and not yesterday because I had a, a bit of an issue after changing malloc to use ebx as a return since the int has to go into eax I needed something else to return the pointer for malloc and I'll get to this in a little bit as well but as far as actually writing the thing it's not very very bad I just had to change eax to d or c for the 32-bit C decal calling convention, EAX, EDX, and ECX are callee saved, not caller saved. So the system called dispatcher, or whatever other functions up in the call stack that the compiler's messing with is not gonna affect AX, DX, or CX if I wish to return a pointer from there. I tried using EBX, but that's caller saved, and it wasn't working because it didn't have the right value going through. That may have been the cause of some other issues with EBX and things, other registers in the past, now that I'm thinking about it, but there might still be some hidden issues there in, in other parts of the system. That's okay. But I'm going to try to go for that first. Uh, after that, I want to try to refactor the calculator a little bit, to use printf instead of plain write calls, and also to take in an expression, or we'll say maybe like a series of expressions on the on the call stack, like the int argc argv, we could pass in a double quoted string with um, like 10 plus two or something, and the calculator can just evaluate that and return instead of taking in input interactively. So I kind of want to do that. If I get through those, I might start refactoring the editor and I might get to the make file, probably not on this video, but we'll see. I want to refactor the make file again, the build system to be more, to be closer to actual make and POSIX make as far as, um, as far as inference rules and using suffixes and things better. I should just be able to dictate, I want these final objects and then say, those are required to, well, those have prerequisites for like the source files required to build those objects. But the, you should just be able to specify an object in a make file and it'll check the files required to build that object according to suffix and inference rules. And then if the date is newer than the final thing that it's building, then it'll run it because it'll see it's newer. And the whole point with that is just to cut down on this, you know, having to build the whole thing every time. These files, like the fonts, are never really going to change. Uh, the assembly will change rarely. The kernel stuff will change most often. But if something's not changing, I don't want to have to build it every single time. So that'll be in the future, if not on this video. I might have to move things around a bit, but oh well. I'll get to some light refactoring work because I'm talking too much, so a couple just barely barely any changes here since the last one, just some stuff I noticed. If we're writing to the terminal, and this is in syscall write, if we pass a file descriptor of, you know, one, one or two, I think, for standard out or standard error, we're going to write to the terminal. That returns or should return the number of bytes that was written, so I can just return that early instead of going down and opening 
a file table entry for standard out, say, and, and allocating stuff potentially and doing this other stuff. Maybe I'll have to do this later, depending if I actually set up pipes and streams and stuff. I'm not sure. But right now I don't need to do that, so I'm just going to just going to return early so I don't have to do that. But as far as refactory and like system calls in here, if we just returned an int, then instead of doing inline assembly, we could just say return bytes written. You know, so that's one reason why I wanted to do refactoring for uh, for the system calls. Just make things a little bit easier, a little bit more succinct and less inline assembly code. And if I pass in destructive registers on the stack as well, I wouldn't have to move things in like this. I shouldn't have to already. I just didn't sit down and think about it deeply until a couple days ago. I should be able to pass like a struct on here, like a regs T or something, but I'll make that in a second. Uh, the other new stuff was in the kernel. And I'm initializing memory. So messing around with different optimization levels, I had some issues with printing the prompt and other things were, were erroring out, like for printing the directory and just other areas. So, you know, if I malloc memory, that memory is not, it's, it might not necessarily be initialized to zero or anything. It's going to be uninitialized memory. I don't have a C alloc, right? I, I really should make a C alloc, but... I don't have an allocate and clear, so that doesn't initialize the memory. So I'm just setting it, you know, to zero. That's all. So if there's a, a weird issue, don't... What did I do? I don't like when my jump list messes up like that. It really makes me mad. Init fs vars. If there was an issue before where the directory in the prompt was printing like a space or something, it shouldn't be. It should only be a slash, and that's because the ending null byte uh, wasn't being copied over because string copy doesn't copy over the null byte. So really, I could do a mem copy and do like two bytes here or something. But this is fine. We'll just uh, we'll just do that. <laughs> but that ensures that the prompt is always going to be a single slash, and everything's there. Everything's fine there. You know, this still works, type still works. So I'm going to get on refactoring some system calls here. Hopefully it doesn't all break, we'll find out. I'm going to start in the wrappers function, which I called syscall wrappers, because these have, well, these are all returning an int, so actually we're okay with that. I might not have to mess with the C wrapper functions, actually. The other ones were malloc and free, which I probably should move over there instead of having them in standard live, but that's how the C standard live has things laid out. I'm going to put this not on its own line to save some space. This is going to probably still have to be inline assembly just to call int 80. But this pointer that we're going to return for malloc specifically, this one will be changing. I'm going to do edx. Because CX and DX are also available, being Kali saved for the 32-bit x86C calling convention <laughs> for CDECL. EAX is, but I'm going to have EAX be just a generic, like, return from the system call here. Yeah, <laughs> it'll implicitly be set to a value. So I could, I could even set another thing here as, like, the return code and have EAX overwrite that. That might be something to add. And then we can check return codes instead of doing... For malloc, it would return a pointer. It doesn't really matter. But since I'm going to be returning an int from all the system calls to be consistent, malloc is the one that returns a specific pointer. So I need to have that in a different variable or register in this case. So I'm going to do edx for that. Uh, free is fine. And the other ones should be fine. Yeah, open, close, read, write. These all return ints anyway as results. So those are all okay. Okay, but all these all these actual system calls here, I'm going to take, change these. I really don't have a need for the tests. I mean, one test would be okay. The other one, maybe I'll make syscall zero like a a default system call to, I don't know, return an error code or something. We don't have this implemented or you called the wrong number. Like, I could do that. Instead of having a hard limit of 10 on the total system calls, if some user code calls with a number outside of 10, that would break things or cause page faults and stuff. So I could just have them all be rerouted to, like, you know, everything just points to one function pointer to return an error, and that would be this. Maybe I can do that in the future. I'm not sure. But I am going to make all these things return ints. 
or in my case, probably int 32s. And we'll just return, I don't know, something, return success or something. I don't have, I don't have that. I'll just add it here. What's another include? Just a bunch more data on the stack when it's compiling, that's okay. But we'll return exit success, which is zero, but that's fine. Just for ones we don't expect to error, even though they could. But I'm gonna make all these ints. and replace some inline assembly where we find it. Not really in here, I don't think, but we could. We could do that actually in a bit. I don't know why that's commented out. That's probably been there forever. <laughs> that doesn't need to be there. So malloc, I'm going to have return an int as previously stated, but this is going to be with an edx and it'll be changed in a minute when registers are different. But I will move the pointer, we'll make that general into edx, and we'll return exit success, which is going to be an integer, that's going to be with an eax. So we can't return the pointer, also an eax, we have to return it in another register, I'm using edx. ebx would not be available, do not do ebx, you will get inconsistent or wrong values on return, because that is a caller saved register, and the compiler will take that into consideration. If you write all this in assembly, you know, you can do what you want but uh, otherwise you can't. Yeah, the EDX, I might still have to do this, but as far as inputs, I'll make a register struct in a bit and we can make stuff like this look a little nicer and all in C and not in line assembly. Right now I can't do that. And free is going to return stuff as well. We'll just say, hey, it's probably gonna be free. But if I change these to do ints, stuff like syscall right here, instead of returning negative one in EAX and then doing a return effectively, we can just return negative one. So that's a lot easier, that's a lot simpler there. All the errors will just return negative one. Say invalid FD for writing. And it saves some lines of code. This is going to return bytes written, because that's going into EAX and returning. Even though this is being set equal here, so really we could just return that. So that would look a little bit better. There we go. Just do that. Turn early. This is also the same, going to be bytes written. That's going to, yeah. Error if file not found or is not open. So in this case, bytes written is being used as a sort of error condition because that is zero. We could return an error instead of a zero because they didn't even try to read the file here. We couldn't read it at all. So I might return negative one here because this is kind of an error, yeah. We'll just say file not found or is not open. That'll be another error case. And only open for reading would be an error case. I do, yeah, want to move to some kind of better way of handling that. Maybe an error struck somehow in the future or Returning a number, an error code within EAX, but having that be just an offset into a global string array or table of strings or something, maybe with other info metadata attached later on. That way we could say we return negative, well, Linux does like Eno stuff, but for error number, we could just return like, you know, negative 5003 or something, you know. I guess that's kind of like what Windows does, which isn't necessarily better implementation. But we can say we can return something like this, any negative value is an error, and whatever this offset is into a global string table, we'll have an error for like a string that says, I don't know, uh, FD only open for reading or something. It won't be in all caps, I won't yell at you, but we can have something like that. And this would be an offset into a table which has this, but that's something kind of far in the future, I guess, I don't know. Still thinking about how I wanna do global error handling things. Because if we just get a negative one from this function, we don't know if it's for the FDs invalid or it's for standard in or the file. We had a file table thing, but it's not open or not found, or it's only open for reading. We, we can't differentiate unless I do something more granular or doing like, you know, monotonically decreasing error codes or something. So I don't know, I'm still thinking about it. We'll just do negative one for that. So if it's here, we'll do that. Any other places I return, I do right here. 
couldn't allocate enough memory for file. I'll need to do that to do another error. So this is just all guard clauses until they finally get through with it. <laughs> and we're returning bytes written. Hey, I'm also assuming all these will work. I'm just changing it to be like that. But effectively, that's what I'm doing. It's an integer going to EAX and returning. So that should be OK. So move. Move FD in case of error. FD is negative one here. We'll do that. Didn't have create flag. Uh, let's say your otherwise does not have creation flag error. And this one could not create file at path. That'll be an error as well. It is a lot easier in C than having to deal with inline assembly everywhere which I think is nice. Just return the FD number here. And it'll be negative one on error anyway, that's fine. Close, almost getting to the end of the list here, close. What do we have? Result, if it's invalid, result is set to negative one, that's okay, you can just return a negative one there. Same for this, for these errors. Otherwise, zero is success. I guess for a close, that is true. Oh, we'll return zero. That works. Now I'm going a little fast here for my, for my takes, but it's really just basic refactoring stuff. I wanted something I didn't have to think too much about. <laughs> so that's why I'm doing this now and get it out of the way instead of the other 5,000 to-dos I have in the code, right? But that's okay. So return bytes read, number of bytes actually read for read, yep. And seek. We'll return an int if fd is less than zero, result is set negative one, we'll do that. That is the error case. Now I could abstract these things later, because these are like general, this is a general thing I'm doing between multiple system calls. So that this could be extracted into a different helper function or something. Some overall thing to check general errors and other things to have it just in one place that I could add common functionality between functions to. And, you know, not having to repeat myself later on in five places, right? That, that would be something that would probably be better, but I'm not doing that. Return result, which is still negative one. So on error, can't seek before, start a file, yeah. Did not pass whence value, it's also gonna be wrong. Return negative one, break, sure. Otherwise, yeah, we'll return the offset. I like it when code, when I, I like it when I delete more code than I add. And here, it's very easy. We had a bunch of void pointers. Right, we have functions that return a void. Yeah, pointers, pointers to <laughs> functions that return void, that take in void. So now it's gonna be int32, so it's functions that return an integer that take in void. And I'll change this void in a second, but we'll keep it that way so this compiles. Which I think it should, other than a couple places. Unused variable, hey, means we can delete more code. Uh, three, six, seven. That's five, six, go down by 11. This is called close. And we're not using that. And in seek, are we using it? No. Hey, that's good, no result variables left. That's better, that's less local variables on the stack, so that's less stack space used for these functions, which is nice. Even, well, less than what I'm already using, but <laughs> that's all right. You can just return, you know, integers, some literal values. In sleep, we return from the end of non-void. That's true, yeah, that is true. Uh, we can return success. We'll just update that. Okay, so now let's see if anything broke. You know, printf, like printing this text from directory and everything, that calls malloc, and that calls write. So that's one thing. And if we run the tests and they still work, then read and write and seek and open have been called and assume we're working there. We can test read with checking 
text from these files. So system calls still seem to be okay. I think we're all right there. We'll try sleeping for 20 milliseconds and that still works. So yeah, I think we're okay. And it makes things a little more succinct and a little better. We can have actual return codes, not just voids now. So that's, that's pretty nice. That was easy, but I'm going pretty fast. Sorry about that. I'm going fast for me. It's probably not fast for other people. But hopefully I explained things okay as to why I wanted to change it to an int. For malloc, we changed to edx in the caller in C standard live and in the syscall malloc itself, so that's okay. I'm using edx there. Yeah, which has equal d pointer. Just to make sure, because I worry about these things. Um, here, yeah, I have equals, equals D. If that's under my face, let's move it up there. For malloc equals D, so that's EDX. And over here, yeah, syscall malloc, EDX. So that's okay. Okay, now let's have a C struct. So Linux has like a PT underscore regs structure. They pass around a pointer to that. I'm gonna pass around just the structure as data that's going to exist on the stack. And this works because uh, C is pretty cool. I just don't think about it, so I don't realize really easy things that I can implement. You know, like saving a line by moving the brackets, but. <laughs> so we have a void, this is called dispatcher void. This function is naked. Naked function means there's no function prologue or epilogue in the x86c calling convention for C decal where everything's on the stack. This includes, among other things, probably moving the stack pointer to the base pointer, uh, first it would push the base pointer, then it would move this, and then you'd, you know, you can subtract from ESP for local variables that you have on the stack and other stuff. So, you know, this is effectively a, a very minimal prologue. Maybe you'll have other things that you push and pop later for the epilogue. Moving EBP back into there and popping EBP. So this basically, you know, saves the caller's stack frame and restores the caller's stack frame, right? This is not included on a function if you have the naked attribute set. But for something, those are function calls. <laughs> for something like this, these system calls actually do have something like those prologues and epilogues um, by virtue of not being the naked functions. They don't have that attribute set. So even though there's nothing on the stack, there's no input parms here. This will still have that function prologue to set up a stack and it will still have the epilogue to return. So there could be issues already where this doesn't work if you're trying to do this with ESP or something. I'm just assuming these registers aren't being affected, which is not great. That's, that's kind of, it seems fragile to me, but. So I'm, I'm saying that because we can have stuff on the stack and this will still work. We can set variables explicitly. Like if we set, this, if we said this was going to take in like some kind of code or something here, um, that would be on the stack after, at this point, ESP would include that. And as part of the function prolog, it would probably have some more, some more code to push or subtract from ESP for that to work. I'm not really sure. Where am I going with this? I'm not really sure, but <laughs> uh, we'll be taking that into case. So taking that into account, um, and since I'm pushing all of these before I do a call, we have all of these values and these variables and these segment registers. All of these are going to be on the stack. Sorry, I keep doing that. All these will be on the stack at the point of this call, right? Obviously. So if we call a system call, all those registers, if we call seek, for example, EAX will have the system call number for seek, but all the other registers, right? These are going to be on the stack. I mean, these will also have the values, but they're going to be on the stack at this point. So what we can do is say we have a struct that contains all of these registers in this order, and we can access that as an input parameter for these syscalls at this point. Uh, the reason I brought up the naked attribute was because technically a call instruction is pushing the address right after the call instruction onto the stack and then jumping to the address of this function, right? And then a, a ret instruction, which is probably also part of a function epilogue, a ret, or for interrupts and iret, other things. A return is going to pop whatever was last pushed on the stack from the call instruction. That would be the return address, which would be this instruction. So it'd get that address back and then, you know, jump to that. 
So I'm saying that because you would normally have that return address pushed onto the stack instead of, you'd need that in addition to these if you're going to make like a register struct that we're gonna pass around. But since these functions are not naked and the prologue and epilogue are handled for you, um, <laughs> an actual function here, not the syscall table, if we pass in a register struct here, this was like a struct or something, we would have access to that without needing to take into account this extra return address. We, we can just specify these. I just, I wanna make sure that, you know, normally there would be an extra four bytes for the return address. And if the function was naked, then you would have to take that into account. But since it's not, we can just say all of these registers can be within a struct that we pass around. Um, and if that doesn't make sense and I badly explained, that's, you know, oh well. <laughs> Let's make that a void again, just so I don't forget. So I'm gonna have a type def up here. Uh, let's call it syscall regs t. I might could put this inside of the numbers file. I don't know, but I'll put them in here because it's only going to be used in this file right now. And I'll have this be the sort of layout that we're doing for all the registers we're going to push before we call uh, before we call a system call. So that's going to be all these registers here. They're not going to be push instructions. I don't think I have to make this packed since they're all going to have the same width of four bytes. So, you know, there's not going to be extra padding or anything. There could be though. So just to, you know, prevent that. I don't think this is needed, but to prevent that, I'm just going to have this set as packed. So this is the order in which registers are pushed when a system call is called. So these are pushed onto the stack in this order and the stack grows downward. What that means is that at a system call function, inside of this function, if we were to put regs t here, which I wanna do, for example, uh, the first value at regs t would be whatever the first value is that was last pushed on the stack, which normally is gonna be that return address, but since the prologue and epilogue will handle that for you, we don't have to worry about that. We can just start from here if we put it uh, in opposite from this order inside the struct. So the first thing that's going to be on the stack is the last thing that was pushed. But the first thing inside of a struct, the first member, is the earliest in memory for the struct. So if we laid out the struct with EAX first and ESP last, EAX would be, we're saying, is going to be the first thing on the stack, right, in this case. But that's not true. We pushed it in this order and the stack grows downwards. So these have to be in reverse order <laughs> in order for the last thing on the stack, ESP, to be located in the struct that we pass to these things and be correct in, you know, in memory. So I didn't say that very well, but that's what I mean. We gotta have these in reverse order because at, at the start of memory, where the struct is gonna be pointing to the stack variables, it will be the last thing we pushed on the stack. And above that will be the next thing we pushed on the stack. And yeah, I haven't studied, you know, system calls and uh, calling conventions in a while, so. <laughs> I had to remind myself of that the last couple days. That's why normally if you do the function prologues yourself in assembly, you'll see uh, they push EBP, they move SP into BP, and you do BP plus 8, because the first four for 32-bit will be that return address. The next four after that would be what actu whatever you're actually doing. So let me not make these push. These will be, um, we'll make them 32-bit, four bytes each, because I'm in 32-bit. I'll just get rid of that and these slashes. I'll just put them all there. And this allows things to be a lot nicer when we're actually using register values that are, they could be in the registers themselves, but if it's on the stack, we can work with them a lot easier just in C. So that's pretty nice. It could be slower, probably is a little slower, but that's all right. All this stuff's already on the stack in this order in memory, it's just easier to work with it this way. So say registers pushed onto stack when a syscall function is called, uh, we'll say from, from the syscall dispatcher. Okay, so what this means, if we take in registers here, means if we want to use those register values, we can, now, if we have something like an exception with the interrupt frame, I'm already doing that separately, where we affect, we have um, CS and IP and stuff. Here we don't, although we could, you know, add that down here or something. But 
Um, this isn't a good example because I don't have the stuff here, but I could use it as an example here. If we say we call syscall test zero, all this stuff's going to be on the stack. How do we use that? Well, we can call like printf. I think I have standard IO. Yeah. We can just see like values that we have as, as an example. So, well, this one won't be the best case. I, I want to use something where EAX isn't going to be zero. So we can check that value. So let's say we have it here. And let's say we do printf and I'll just get rid of, get rid of this stuff. Let's say slash r slash n. I'll do those both. Let's say EAX will be the syscall number. So let's say syscall number, syscall number EAX will be an int. And, you know, if we have other values, then we can change other values there. So let's just have an example EBX value that we pass into this. And since we have those things on the stack now, I can just do regs, since it'll be in this order. It'll be this order in memory, but the order it was pushed is in this order, but I should just be able to offset and do regs.ebx, for example, or regs.eax. And it should just work. So this will be eax and regs.ebx. This makes input farms a whole lot nicer to deal with. We don't have to do this anymore, for example. Um, or like in, yeah, like in malloc, taking the bytes here, we don't have to do this. We can just say bytes equals regs.evx or use that down here. So that's pretty nice. But I'm going to do it as a, a little test here to see if we print these values out. I'm going to put that within the kernel. Let's say right before we're printing stuff. So this will be syscall test. Syscall regs test, I'll say this is. And we'll do int 80. 18t syntax is $80. And we'll say nothing on output, but on input, A will be 1, or syscall test 1, I think I called it. And the syscall numbers file. And then ebx. I'll put to some value that we can see that it actually works. So let's put put the good old dead beef in there. That would be an X value we would do for that, I think. So we'll see if that works. If not, then I'll print an int value. I'm not sure. I meant EBX to be X. I'll see if that works or not. Okay, so we'll see. We have issues. Oh, we have issues there. I did not end with a semicolon. That is my bad. Let's fix that. Fix those first. Unused parameter, yes. And test zero, that's true. We'll just tell it to silence that. Initialization of int pointer from incompatible. Oh, because I'm taking those in. Yeah, I could do that, but that is just a warning, right? It still makes everything. Yeah, so let's see if that works first, then I'll change where those are in the list. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Easiest test of my life. Nothing's ever that easy. Syscall number EAX. We're using, well, we don't see it there anymore. <laughs> We're using regs.eax and regs.ebx. And those values are set. Control Alt G, give me my pointer back, please. There we go. Those values are set here. So that is a lot nicer to work with as far as stuff you know, just being offsets into a struct. That's how memory works. Uh, I just got to remind myself how memory works sometimes. As mine sometimes fades, but that's okay. So we have these. Those are in here. I'm not going to make it constant in case we want to. In case we want to change the values and not overwrite them later from the dispatcher. So we want to just add ESP for all these or something. Well, all the ones that would be callee saved, which would be at max CX and DX from here. Oh, and also, since I'm returning EDX, I should not be popping this value into there. Oh, that would be bad. Do not overwrite EDX as some syscalls, i.e. Hmm, let's say EG malloc. Um, let's just do this. Some syscalls, i.e. malloc. 
will need it. I'll just say that. So I'll do that here. So this takes care of this ESP. Do not overwrite ESP. Then we have EBX, CX, DX, BX, CX, DX, I don't want to do, then SID, IBP, DSE, SF, SGS, yeah. And we'll save EAX. Don't, don't restore, I guess. Restore would be a better word because it's popping previous value, but I'll say don't overwrite. Okay. So we have syscall regs t, that would be where I'm defining these functions that return an int 32 and take in something, that something they take in would now be syscall regs t, so they can take in registers. And that is a yeah function pointer table of those, so we'll just have to change these again. I guess I'll go bottom up since I'm already here. Syscall regs t regs, I don't have it named. I could name them in, his, in this maybe, but yeah, that's fine. So this also makes these things easier to work with, right? We don't have to do this anymore. I'll just comment that out in case it breaks and I don't know what I'm talking about. But we can now use the regs values that have these register values in them to make this a little bit easier. We could even set these from those values. Or we could have them be defaults, but uh, since I'm overriding this anyway, if it's actually true, otherwise I'm returning an error, yeah, we can overwrite these values. So FD will be... B, so regs.ebx. Offset is going to be C, so regs.ecx. And wince value is D, so regs.edx. And that's just, in my opinion, a lot easier to work with. Regs.edx, not just edx. And then if we don't change anything else, we don't need to. We don't have any more inline assembly in one of these functions. You know, hallelujah for that. And yeah, I did put int code down there, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, we could take in a value there, but I'm going to say we're not going to. Okay. And then the other function signatures don't match, right? But that's all right. I just want to see if the tests work, particularly since we just changed seek to use those values. So that would dictate, hey, seek still works, at least on an empty file. And we should be able to read these still. Hello world, okay. So I'll go ahead and change the other functions to have regs and we'll remove some inline assembly there and clean up some code a little bit. Remove more lines of code than we add, hopefully, but maybe not. We'll see. But I am excited about this. So FD is an EBX. Always happy to clean up code here. ECX, and of course this will be an integer value, right? This is a uint, and I'm setting a void buffer. So I might have to do like this for that value. I'm not sure. I'll do that just in case. ETX. Don't have to do that. And we have, okay. I'm just seeing if I have any other spots of inline assembly. So now we can write syscalls all in C now, which is very nice. I do like that. ebx0, we can just say, hey, this is going to be regs.ebx, assuming we add that. And let's just make sure the tests still work. Okay, so seek doesn't work anymore, so that's good. <laughs> or another thing doesn't work anymore. I figure that would happen. This is also an int, and I know some of these are uints, so actually wrapping behavior might be bad here. That's something I did not take into mind and in, or into consideration. I probably should have. I mean, I could cast it to an int, which kind of should be what it's doing. Does it give me an error on signedness? It probably does, right? Hmm. Malloc is incompatible, that's fair. I do have to redo that one, and free, that's probably why. Open and write, it doesn't like it. Compatible pointer type, so why is that incompatible? 
Reed has Syscall Regs T Regs, and I'm taking that on here. That's what they take in. That should be all right. Um, let me add this to the other ones, which will probably break things <laughs> even more. Those need to have this. Free is going to have it. It'll give me errors for unused. Well, it'll give me warnings for unused variables. That's okay. We can mess with those. And uh, and fix it. We can fix those. Yeah, unused parameter. That's Those are fine. As long as that's like the only issue here. It doesn't like sleep either, but all right. It did make it, even with those warnings. But this gives... An, okay, it doesn't give an issue now. <laughs> I mean, the compiler could be trying to work around things that I'm saying are going to be on the stack that aren't, even though they were. It could have, it could have optimized stuff away or moved things around. I'm not sure. But uh, that did fix that issue, which is good. Just if you say you're going to have a re an input parameter, then actually put that there and use it, right? This is a test system call. I don't really need this, but I could just put this stuff in. So system call number, I'm just going to put, um, I don't know, default syscall. Syscall number is an EAX. Uh, oh yeah, and then that's rigs. Let's just not do this. We'll just print out where we're at. Or we could say it's invalid, you're not supposed to call it, but I'll say, eh, it's, it's whatever. Technically, it's a test syscall. So we'll just say these are test syscalls, that's, that's fine. Then that'll get rid of the unused parameter thing. And even though we still have the others, so sleep. Yeah, we're not doing anything with that. So EBX. I'm moving EBX and overriding sleep timer ticks. So what I could do... It's greater than zero. I'm getting the value. Am I moving that into there? Yes. I'm getting that value and I'm waiting until it's not there. Yes. Because I'm changing that within the pick. Okay. So we can set that value here because this is what I'm doing effectively. Sleep timer ticks equals regs.ebx. It's moving ebx to that value. That value is the sleep timer ticks dereferenced. So that'll be all right. Set ticks value to sleep for. And we can check right quick if sleep still works. Even though it's a little iffy, it's not quite super accurate with me being recording everything at the same time. But 500 milliseconds is approximately half a second. And if it doesn't work, that's not good. <laughs> or if it's incredibly slow. Okay, it did return. If we sleep for one second, it's going to be a lot longer than one second. As long as it does return, that's okay. Sometimes time gets a little wacky depending if I have drift fix slew and other things that are there. Yeah, that's gonna take forever. Uh, it does behave a little better when I'm not recording. And this isn't the most accurate emulation, but as long as we can sleep and return, that's, that's all right. And actually we can check. We can check and know that a date is running. I run date time, so yeah. It is it is running. It's just sometimes the pit is not super fast and accurate on here because that's a lot of emulation stuff, but all right. It's also not 619. <laughs> it's more like, uh, what is it actually? It's, you know, four hours later. Well, it's ten, yeah, it's like four and a half hours after what that says. Um, but okay, let's... Uh, I can do that, can't I? Let's do do as. That's periodic daily. This is what I want to do. TTY is required. You person. So NTP doesn't run on the daily because I think my PC goes to sleep and stuff and it doesn't run when it's supposed to, whatever. Also, maybe it takes forever to actually send and receive queries, and that could also be an issue. That may be the issue. Oh, timed out waiting. There we go. The other one got it. So then it updates. Yeah, that's what time it is. 
I have to do that now and then. Sometimes stuff like curl or other things fails because the, the time isn't right. It's like three days in the past. You're like, why isn't NTP running? It's supposed to be. That's all right. Or not running correctly, rather. But oh well. So bytes. I'm moving ebx into bytes. Let's do that. Regs.ebx. And here. Since this is going to be on the stack, I mean, I might, I might, could move this into edx. I'm not sure, and I don't really want to mess with it too much, but maybe I could do this, and that would work. I don't think that's correct. <laughs> Pointers are going to be the same size on 32-bit, so this is okay if I want to cast it, but I don't think that's great, but I might try and see if that works. Because I'm not sure if that's equivalent, and if the normal prologue and epilogue stuff will, will have that be affected. If this data is going to be popped or put back on the stack. So if, if malloc and everything fails right here, and it does, yeah, that means that, that that does not work like I thought it was going to. Which is good. Or well, it does work like how I thought it was going to, rather. By not working with EDX there, yeah. So don't break malloc, it breaks everything else. You know, keep that in mind. Words to live by, right? Okay, free. Let's set the pointer to ebx. And just to make sure, I'll do this. Again, not sure I have to do that, but we'll do that. Free. We can see if we have memory leaks, if free is working. So, for example, print memory map calls printf, which calls write, which calls malloc. So we don't have memory leaks so far. We will use an extra block or two for tests. Which is going to be 14, but that should not increase if we do stuff, which is good. Uh, we also have a malloc test, right? I don't know if that program works anymore, actually. It doesn't. That's good to know. <laughs> oh, I'll have to look at that in the future. Oh, well. I'm not dealing with that right now. Okay, ebx, regs.ecx. I guess make that a pointer because it's a pointer. Regs.edx. I do like lining these up, but that is a habit from work. Yeah, FD buffer in length. FD buffer length. Yeah, okay. No other inline assembly we have to deal with here, just the input parms. So not too bad. File path. Convert to a character pointer. Of ebx, what did I set fd to? Oh, fd is just set to negative one. All right, let's put these first, although I don't need to, but file path is ebx, flags is ecx, and we'll have an fd here, negative one. We don't need this. That's on open, so let's make sure that works as well. Okay, we say open is there, so we should be able to do type on one of these files and print it out, so open's good, okay. Good to know. I like it when stuff goes smoothly, and maybe it's only smoothly because I borked everything testing the past couple days, but I don't record that, so. <laughs> the other stuff is set, this is set, okay. Yeah, we should be good to go, at least as far as saying we're, we're done with this refactor. So that's good. I'm going to count that as a successful thing because I refreshed how I did memory in the stack, how that's going to work. Again, what you push on the stack is going to be in reverse order if you make a struct that represents what that stack data is. The first thing in memory at the struct is going to be the last thing on the stack here. Here. <laughs> if you're considering that from the perspective of the input to a function in C. So... Pretty handy, I like that. There's probably other places this could come into play, having structs that represent the stacked, the stack state. Can't say that five times fast, but that's good. I'm calling that a successful refactor. The other thing I wanted to do, if I have time, is gonna be probably the calculator accepting things. Let me check. Okay, I'm not sure I can get that done in like 10 minutes, but we can try here for a speed run. <laughs> But I don't want to do a speedrun and not explain anything, so that's not the point. But where I'm getting in the kernel, 
where I'm tokenizing my input, which is going to be down here, this get token loop, which probably should be like a separate function or whatever to get the next token, but whatever. We don't have a, a good tokenizer. I want to take in double quoted strings. Sing we could do single quote, but I figure that's, I don't know, like an array of characters, which is a string, but let's say we're only gonna do double quote and say that that is a specific single token. So instead of white space delimiting things, if we wanted to send a mathematical expression to the, the basic calculator. So let's say we wanna send five plus two. So these would be, as this currently is, it skips on white space. This is gonna be three tokens, but I wanna have something like double quoted five plus two and have this count as one complete token and we send that to the calculator. So one argv value would be this whole string, not the three separate strings for five and plus and two. So that's what I wanna to try to do here. We'll skip white space. We found the next non-space character. I'll have a basic test. I do want this to be different in the future if we want to, you know, capture more things than just a double quote. That would get annoying here with separate cases and ifs and a switch or whatever, but we can worry about that later. Let's say if the data at, so I'm using command string pointer, nice name. <laughs> command string pointer, if that data is a double quote, which I probably have to escape, then we want to keep reading until um, ending double quote delimiter. I'm not handling quotes inside of quotes. So if you send, you know, inner strings within your outer string, I'm not counting that. <laughs> We're just going until like this. And then this will be, well, in this case, it'll look weird. This will be a token and a space. And then this will be a token. And then this will be, but whatever, don't do that. You know, <laughs> we don't have a great parser here. I want to probably go past this right now because we're already pointing for argv. We just need to decide when to end the token. So, or at least when to stop and get to the next one. So I'll do this and we'll say while the data at command string pointer is not a double quote escaped. Then I guess we'll keep going. That would probably work. We could just have that be the case. But that would, yeah, we have to move past once or else it'll immediately end from the first one. So what that means is after it reaches the ending double quote, it'll say if it's not a space, it'll be on the double quote, then it'll go on anyway. If it is a space, then it'll go on anyway, <laughs> or the end of the string. And then it'll skip white space. Okay, and then get the next one. So we'll have to, I might want to end it with a null because that's what I was doing before, right? Oh, I have it right here. Okay, so let's say right now, if I don't do anything, if we sent this string, you know, five plus two, what would happen in here? We'd say, well, it's a space. Uh, let's say we prep end it with like three spaces or something. So it'll skip those spaces, set them to nulls. It'll reach this double quote. Let's say we send this to the calculator. So we have calculator.bin, that's gonna be a token, and then it's reading, and it reaches the double quote. It says, okay, we found the next non-space character, that's argv of argc2. Will that be argv2? Well, argv0 would be argc, it would be argv1, yeah. Argv0 would be the name, this would be argv1. We found the double quote, we'll increment, so we'll be on the five. While it's not an ending quote, we'll keep incrementing, one, two, three, four, five. And then it says, while it's not a space, increment. So it'll increment again. And it's not a null. It will be a null at this point, but yeah, it'll catch that on the next one. It'll say this is the end of input. It'll go to the top. While it is a space, since we put the enter key, it'll probably say that is a space. It is a white space, because we have that capturing slash R for the enter key. It'll set that to a null. That'll be the end of input, and then we'll go on. So that should work, that would pass the next thing. And if we sent multiple strings to the calculator, you know, 20 minus five, we'll say 200 divided by 10 or something, it should send all these within, all these strings within separate argv values. So that'll be okay. That should work, that's actually very simple. It's, <laughs> if it's, it's simple, it's more robust and less bugs, so don't worry about it. Okay, 
So with that being said, I want the calculator to be able to take in a string token like that. Uh, let's say found double quoted string, count this as one full token. Count the string as one full token. Okay, let's mess with the calculator right quick and make sure that compiles first, all right? So the calculator, I don't wanna clear the screen on inputs. My ideal here would be to take in these strings, these expressions, and instead of the input buffer here being the result of the user typing in keys like this, I wanna be able to just send expressions at the command line. So like in here, if I'm doing something like, you know, DC calculator, let's say we have 10 to plus, this should be 12 and we'll quit. We'll print that out and then quit. I'm not gonna make a DC clone, but I could eventually. I just want to be able to take in a full string and pass it to the calculator, not have to say run an expression. But that's kind of the equivalent I'm doing here. So, okay, how would I do that? Well, I do want to change the printf as well. Then we don't need to pass that specifically. That would just be, you know, a little bit more savings and bytes. But not very much. I'm only using printf down here too. Okay. I don't need to mess with the cursor if I'm not doing interactive stuff, but right now in the calculator, it doesn't print the cursor to begin with. I do want to change that. It, it makes the cursor on, but doesn't do anything. So I'm going to print a space, which would make the cursor draw a line for the cursor. But then we'd be one after where we want to be. So I'm going to do a backspace after that. And instead of E's, I'll do a, the octal stuff because slash E isn't in the C standard. And we'll do a backspace. For my terminal, that's how it works. So we'll print a space with the cursor, and then the, the cursor physically would be after the space, but we'll back up by one. So we still have that visible cursor, but we can type over it just to know where we are. But we'll turn the cursor off and then do a space so it erases anything that might be there. And that should be okay for input. The reason I'm doing that, if it's fixed now, you won't see it, but it'll clear the screen um, and we're not clearing the screen. Okay. <laughs> so my reasoning would be doing, you know, now we can type in a 10 and receive a 10 and go back. And in the past, after doing that, I couldn't reboot. So let me see if that, that's not broken. Okay. In the past that was broken, but that's separate. It's orthogonal. So I do want a new line to begin with as well. So let's just do that. But that would do every time. Let's only do the first character we're going to input. So when we first enter the calculator, if we're doing it interactively, let's print a new line. We'll do this regardless, actually. But initial new line to not be at end of last user input from prompt, say from shell prompt, maybe. All right. So now this should just go down by one. There we go, 10 plus two is 12. We can return. That still clears the screen. That's from the kernel. I will probably take that out as well. Which would be, let's see, wherever I'm calling argc here. Clear the screen, let's just comment that out. To do, probably remove this. All right, just remove that line. We'll comment that out. And my alarm went off, so I'll just go a couple more minutes to see if we can do this. That's what I always do. Two more minutes. We return, we get the prompt. That's what I was hoping for. Now we have a little bit better behavior. I like it, I like it. So how would we detect if we passed in some expressions that we want to run instead of doing an interactive thing here? Well, we're gonna use argc and argv, so I'll take those out. And we'll see if those are gonna happen here. Let's say that'll be an if statement here. Check if user passed in expressions to evaluate. If so, do not run interactively. Yeah, we'll just do that. So if argc is greater than one, it'll be one automatically. That first token is gonna to be calculator.bin in this case. So it'll be at least one. If it's greater than one, then they passed in extra stuff. We're going to assume there's going to be strings that they passed in. Now, if those aren't valid expressions, then the, the parsing later on should return an error. We shouldn't 
have to mess with that. <laughs> I'm hoping that's already handled, but we'll see. Let's make a loop and we'll loop through these expressions first off. So let's say for, I only have 10 right now, so we'll say they're not gonna pass in more than 255 expressions, hopefully. We can't handle that right now. So we'll say i is, it's going to be at least one for argv. If I go argv i inside of this loop, inside of this iterator, I would be at least one because argv zero is going to be calculator dot bin that that literal string. So let's say, yeah, less than argc i plus plus. So what are we going to do with that value within argv one? I'll probably just set buffer to that value and then we'll evaluate it. That way we don't have to change too much from what we're already doing down here with parse buffer. So let's say set calc input buffer to expression uh, in arg. So let's do mem copy. I don't remember if it's like des then length or what have you. Okay, or mem copy 32, but I'll just do mem copy des source length. Let's say we have des and des will be the buffer. The source is going to be argv1. The length is going to be the length of argv1. Um, but since argv, each thing is going to be double quoted string, this will include the double quotes in the string right now which is not great, I might want to change that. So let's just put this as a to-do. Um, I'll say maybe remove the double quotes from strings in kernel, or can deal with here, that's fine. <laughs> right now I'll just, I'll just deal with this here, that's actually, it's not too bad. We'll just say we're gonna pass in the address of argv1 offset zero, sorry, offset one. Offset zero would be the initial double quote, so we want to move past that and get the inner string. So if we pass in something like, don't do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I almost had a freak out there. I didn't delete the whole window. If we pass in something like five plus two, thank you, I3. You know, we don't want this initial double quote. We want to at least start at the five. So that's what I'm doing, starting at that. And we want to go until the two here. So if we had a string like this, the overall length would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We want to get the inner string, which is length. One, two, three, four, five. So we'll have to do string length uh, argv1 minus two, starting at the character after the first initial double quote and pass that into the buffer. That's what we'll be doing there. So let's do skip initial double quote and stop before ending double quote length minus two. Okay, what will we do after that? I'll probably initialize it first, actually, because we might have other stuff in the buffer from a previous calculation, so let's do that first. We'll mem set buffer zero, size of buffer. So initialize buffer and then we'll mem copy that in. Okay, and then we'll run it, which is gonna be parse buffer here. I would like that to probably take in the buffer's input, but right now it doesn't. I'm just copying what we have here. Don't need to mess with scan, don't need to mess with valid input. We're assuming they passed in a valid math expression here. Clear the buffer, uh, we can just do mem set. So this was before I had mem set. <laughs> If it's zero, we'll do this. Okay, and parse buffer will evaluate. It'll print an error or it'll print the number and it'll be on its own new line. So I th that might all be all we have to do. Um, after those are done, let's say we return exit success or I'll say zero just for a non-answer. Return to caller with success. Okay, else we'll go through interactively. So right now, I mean, having these both being like the main line here isn't great, but uh, this should work. This looks okay. I don't think that's like terrible code or anything. But if we run something like calculator.bin five plus two with the string, it returns a seven. Hey, hey yo. It does return the initial new line, that's okay. What if we pass in two things, 10 minus two, and we pass in 20 divided by two, we should see eight and 10. We see eight and eight. 
I probably have issues with my math in the calculator. Because uh, that's not great. That should be two separate things. And you know why? It's because I'm doing argv1. I need to do argvi. That was the whole point of doing i. So that I go through the argv values. And not put partial shutdown text there. Also, for loop needs to be... What did I just do? I like got rid of a bunch of stuff. Okay, that's where it was. All right. It's getting tired. Okay, so let's do <laughs> let's actually go through the things and iterate through them. And also, I'm not going to do this if it's in batch because effectively this is in batch. We're going to print a new line anyway. So I don't need this unless it's going to be interactive. And this should, yeah, this should work now and we'll be able to run multiple. The reason I do DIR every time, by the way, is just so I don't have a page fault that I put in somewhere from her malloc issues or anything in printing works. It's a good first test, but it's kind of habit. I shouldn't need to do that, but I'm still scared everything's going to break whenever I remake this. So but let's see if we do something like five plus two, which is seven, 10 minus two, which is eight and 400 divided by 20, which should be 20. Okay, we have all those, so we're good. Seven, eight, twenty. It does put like you know two new lines there, but it works for multiple things. It works for strings. We have token delimited on one full tokens as a string, and the calculator works for things from the command line. I think that's pretty awesome. I, did. I don't sound genuine right now, but I do. I do think that's pretty cool um, and nice. But this probably doesn't need to do this full thing here. Let's say I'm just going to make these one liners right now. We can mess with the the spacing later, but right now I'm, I'm tired and want to go to sleep and this works. So I'm happy with that. Oh, uh, I am happy with that result. I know I'm kind of like rushing myself here and probably going too fast for my own good uh, from my perspective, but I just like that that works. That's that's really nice. And we're not we don't have any memory leaks, you know. Well, let me make sure we don't have any memory leaks. So 10 minus 2, 20 times 20, 3 minus 1. Yeah, we don't have any memory leaks. So we're good to go. Hey. All right. I'm counting that as success. Evaluate expressions through argv and argc. Refactor Sorry that took over an hour, but uh, you know, that's life. So I will actually get to the editor next time, maybe the make file. Depending how long the editor takes, it'll probably break and not work, but I at least want it to open a file with open and close it with close and be able to read and write a text file. So that is going to be the goal for the next video. If I get that done, then I'll try to think about refactoring the make file. I may push this off till later, actually and do make and change directory that might be more interesting for people and i don't think it'll be too hard to add extra folders you know knock on wood or a i don't know particle board whatever this is this desk is not real wood but yeah we'll see i'll see how that goes with the editor and decide if i want to make make more posix ish or go on to directory stuff and screen scroll back and other good changes later so yeah hope you enjoyed Sorry if I tried to ramble faster than usual and my voice is dying, but I wanted to get that done and get a good easy win, and that's what it was. Hopefully you learned a little bit, or it was somewhat entertaining or something. Uh, you know, I like deleting code more than I like adding code. We got this. And get diff, does that tell me how much I deleted? Probably not. Not overall. That's okay. That doesn't have very much in there at all, actually. Oh, because that was from the last time. Yeah, I don't have any new things, right? I don't. Okay. Well, I'm going to add that. Thank you for watching. Appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one. So, cheers.